everybody. Uh, my name's Colin White. I'm the founder of Credit Accept Media, and you're welcome Hi. to the Commercial Hi. Credit Exceptions Conference. Um, I just wanted to say hello to everybody today and um, wanted to let you know that uh, the plan for today. Um, so let me just switch slides so you can see that. So as you can see, uh, this first session coming up, we'll be looking at new world trade credit risks. We've got a slight break. We'll be looking at fraud, the fraud threat, which is quite an interesting one later on. Uh, good to see the rehearsal early in the week. That's really interesting, like all of these are. Um, session three, uh, 11, uh, 12... 11.55, late payment and insolvency. And then we've got one o'clock with Roundup with technology and credit management. Um, so a lot to get through today. Um, but yeah, with the idea of these events is really to give people an overview of what's going on in the commercial credit world. And obviously there's, there's a whole lot of stuff happening now. Um, just when we thought we'd emerge from the depths of the, the pandemic and, and, and hopefully getting some kind of normality, there's a lot going on in the world with with wars and uh, the cost of living, particularly um, now um, with lots of reports coming out impacting the cost of doing business, I think it is what the FSB calls it. Um, so very much a threat to cash flow and the future of businesses. So across these sessions today, we we'll try not to be too doom and gloom, but we're, we're really trying to and, and log in and, 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 and have a talk about some of those um, challenges, I guess we call them, coming up over the next year or so. Um, so this is like the, the third time uh, or fourth time we ran this event. We ran the first two face-to-face, the second one online. Hopefully we'll go back to face-to-face at some point this, um, in the near future. We've got a, a round table actually planned for the Midlands Hotel in Manchester in the year, so we have to cover off stuff like that at these events as well, face-to-face hopefully as well. So uh, give you an idea of our plans there, but I'll cover some more of that later uh, in the, in our event and give you more detail. But over to today, I want you to get involved if you can. Um, as you can see in front of you, you've got a screen. Um, on the left-hand side is information um, where you can read about today's event. And, and if you haven't already, you can register for our next session, which I mentioned was, is going to look at fraud. Um, got speaker profiles. Have a look at those little de- bits of detail about our speakers. There's a couple of things you can download as well and, and find out more about today's event. And then, um, yeah, finally, more importantly, there's a speech bubble there. So if you can um, use that to ask any questions that you have across the day, that would be excellent. Um, but as I mentioned, this first session, we're going to look at um, com- uh, we're going to look at New World Trade Credit, um, which is supported by Marsh McIlland. Um, and I'm going to, with that in mind, I'm going to, pass you over to the chair for this session who is Ian Leslie from Marsh and he will talk you through this session uh introduce our speakers so I'll hand over to Ian and he can introduce himself first Ian over to you yeah cheers Colin um and you said about not being too doom and gloom so we're obviously starting with uh risks which which is you know started off with a bang um so for those of you that don't know me my name is Ian Leslie I work at Marsh in their specialty division uh, as the sales and business development leader for trail trade credit uh, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, in terms of my background, though, it's it's not just insurance. So, for, again, for those of you that have heard this before, I apologise. You're going to hear the story again. But before joining the insurance industry, I was in an even more fast-paced, exciting industry, which is the world of finance. And I've literally spent years going from T-boy to finance director and saw everything in between. So my heart as well of being in insurance has always been in finance. And obviously, a big part of that is, is credit management. So I'm always happy to, to be part of these sessions and to... Uh, be able to facilitate the sharing of of insights and advice and that's what today is all about so the reason we picked a panel of your peers is that we want you to be able to get insight and advice from people who like you are having to battle a ever-changing credit landscape so this is our first session of four as colin rightly said uh, and I, i'm pleased to be joined by three panelists so i'm going to allow you to introduce yourself so that i don't do a botched job of it uh, and I'm going to start with Brad. If you can introduce yourself, please. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody uh, who's um, tuned in. Thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, yes, my name's Brad Morris. I've uh, been in credit and risk for over 25 years. Currently, I am head of credit for Dell Financial Services in the UK and Ireland. Uh, previous to that, I've worked with GE Capital, uh, CIT, and also with uh, Cisco and a couple of other smaller names. And very much looking forward to the discussion interaction on the panel here. Cheers, Brad. Uh, and next up, we have uh, Brian Lewis. Good morning, one and all. Uh, Brian Lewis calling from uh, 
not so sunny glad today. Um, currently, I'm credit manager at CPI Mortars. Um, past lives, I've been with Hanson Quarry Products and Tarmac Quarry Products and uh, many moons ago, an outfit called Tilcom. I'm uh, very pleased to be here this morning and hope I can make a worthwhile contribution. Cheers, Brian. Thank you for that. I'm sure you will. Uh, last up, uh, no means least, uh, Simon Philpin. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, Simon Philpin. Um, I've been in the credit insurance industry now for 22 years. Uh, initially started the career at Atradius, where I was there for 12 years, where I, I concentrate on risk analysis um, and highly leveraged private, act, uh, private equity bank businesses. Uh, for the last eight years, I've been at Markel, where my role is Global Head of Business Development. Uh, so we basically look, look at businesses, uh, look to put policies in place, but equally, I think, which is important for today's discussion, is reviewing credit management procedures of uh, large businesses. And I'm sure we'll be touching on that today. So thank you, Ian. Yep, cheers. Thank you for that, Simon. So just a quick a couple of uh, housekeeping things before we get started with the questions. So as Colin said, this obviously is the second time that we're doing this online, uh, which means you get the joys of it being reasonably interactive. Um, and whilst obviously you guys don't have microphones and can't speak to us, you can still get involved. So and on the right hand side, you'll see the ability to ask questions. Uh, an area that I'll be looking at throughout the uh, throughout the session. So if you do have any questions, we will try and save them to the end unless they're really pertinent for what we're talking about. Um, but do feel free to ask any questions you have. If you want to direct them at a panel member, you can do. Just let me know via the question and I'll do that. If you want them to be more general, that is fine too. So, so let's get into it. So Brian, I'm going to come to you first. Obviously, we've talked before we started about all the impacts that have happened globally. But for you personally, what, how has your business been impacted over the last six months? And how has this impacted your credit management function? Uh, I think uh, over the last six months and down to the end of Q4 last year, the, the biggest impact was the availability of materials to us. Um, we're a manufacturer, so we're dependent on raw material supplies. And at times we're on allocation of materials from our suppliers, from the, the quarrying companies and the um, cement producers, uh, fundamental basic materials for us. Uh, and we were down in places 20-25% uh, of our demand. In turn, that made the availability of our product to our customers uh, slightly less reduced in terms of what we could uh, produce and, and fulfill orders. And at the same time, we were seeing an increase in demand, uh, which got the two bits not join, joining each other. So from a supply and sales viewpoint, that was, that was very, very difficult. We were coupled then with uh, one of our major plants having a breakdown, and normally it's down, down for three or four days. Our problem was it was down for three or four weeks because the parts we couldn't get in from, from Germany uh, mm -hmm. because of Brexit, uh, production issues over there, and then ship, shipping issues over there. And Looking to source materials, uh, we've been importing cement uh, to make up some of the shortfall here in the UK and tr trying to ship those uh, uh, around around the country to wherever, wherever we could get it. Um, obviously, that increased cost in terms of increased prices, which we absorbed for the, uh, down to end the Q4, but we've seen two substantial price increases this year going on to our, our sales values. Um, and in turn, we're seeing uh, customers still demanding product. Uh, it hasn't really slowed down, albeit there was a forecast last week uh, in construction news that house building will start to slow, which is one of our major marketplaces. Um, in turn, from a cash issue, we're, we're now starting to see uh, people struggling to pay or slowing to pay. Uh, in terms of the, the extra cost that they're abs being absorbed. And in, I don't know, probably about a dozen, 15 instances, we've been asked to put back cost breakdowns to customers over the last uh, 12 months or so, so they can go to their, cost their uh, paymasters to negotiate uh, increases uh, because they've been tied into fixed price contracts. And that is becoming a problem because substantial material increases to customers on fixed price contracts impacts their cash flow and obviously their, their profitability. There's uh, 
that relatively a small margin that they can absorb, and then we we will start to see cash flow issues, which are just starting to raise the head at the moment. And the other impact that we've we had uh, is the change to the financial reporting through through COVID to Companies House. Uh, companies now starting to catch up, and in terms. We're, we're, we're seeing the effect in financial accounts of what, what's happened over the last two years. It's starting to unwind and affecting the um, credit worthiness of the, 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 the balance sheet items, i.e. the net worth of the business, uh, in turn affecting for some of those people who insure the amount of insurance cover they can get on, on their debt as well. So yeah. it, it's a pretty mixed bag. I've got to say, it's not just one one thing that's uh, affected us. It, it's uh, it's a combination of factors. Yeah, so it's a really good point you raised about the the financial accounts because, you know, I think we we've always known that they're delayed because you know even when put, people put them online, they relate to the previous year. But because of the two years that we've had, you almost have this strange scenario where you've got lots of sets of accounts being published, and either they're still impacted positively or negatively. Or like you were saying, they just don't really give that full true picture yet. Um, how is, you know, we'll, we'll kind of come to this a little bit later, but is there anything you're doing at the moment to get around that that issue? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just had that thing about financial accounts. One of the other maneuvers we're seeing at the moment are people extending year-end reporting dates. Um, mm. seen, seen quite a few of those, uh, even, even this week, and it's only Tuesday. Um, yeah, in terms of getting that information, when we're looking to assess new customers or increasing uh, credit exposure, we are insisting now upon up-to-date management accounts. Let, let's, see, let's see where you are. And a conversation I had with somebody on Friday was, well, you know, I'm only asking for credit. And I said, yeah, and I'm, I'm asking for information to make a decision. If I was your bank manager, I'd want the same information. And at the end of the day, we are a bank. We're given an unsecured credit period that a specified period of time, whatever the terms might be, and we'd just like to have as much information as possible to make a good decision for all of us. Uh, so where people are refusing to provide that management account information, you have to question how they're running their business or why they would um, not share that information if they were, they're, they're trying to uh, increase the credit facilities. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree, Brian. I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it as well as, as you know, like I said, in terms of being the same as a bank, because essentially you are giving giving credit. Um, I'm going to stick with the the happy theme of uh, of disruption here uh, and come across to you, Brad. Um, supply chain disruption has continued to be a real concern. Obviously, we saw a few standout things over the last two years, but it hasn't really eased off. Um, how has that affected your business, and what's the knock on effect for you personally in terms of credit management? Yeah, thanks very much, Ian. So the short version is within the technology sector, that's where I am within Dell. And even this can ripple over to those who play in the automotive sector. Uh, the global microchip shortage continues to be a significant uh, issue in delaying uh, the fulfillment of customer orders. Now, um, where uh, credit uh, offering um, is in place, it does allow the customer them to the front of the queue in terms of the production cycle and the delivery cycle. Now, that's great because it does show that the credit function does have a particular value add to the entire customer experience. The downside with this is that sometimes where credit is called upon will be to make a rush decision. That could come from a multitude of reasons, boiling down to uh, if the customer can meet a particular production deadline. Uh, there are a number of um, price rises at the materials level, at the, at the supply chain level that many customers and many suppliers and distributors are trying to avoid. So if they can see a price rise is looming, let's say in the next quarter, quarter, there is a significant push to try and get it in with this quarter to at least place the order so that that locks in that price and saves the customer ultimately some money. And uh, then you have the uh, the ominous um, uh, uh, quarter end de deadlines that are always in uh, push. Now, that could either be for yourself or for the distribution partner. So this means that the credit function needs to have very quick decisions uh, to either extend existing credit lines 
or to if you've let's say managed to convert an exist uh, let's say a, a lead or a prospective customer if you've managed to convert that into a uh, a now a hot lead and you want to onboard it um, you've there's now a rush to try and get the entire due diligence process done within a short manner of time now regrettably there's no quick fix to a lot of these decisions and a lot of these problems um, there isn't uh, a silver bullet that's going to stop any of this and I think it's going to get worse uh, sorry to be the bearer of bad news. I think it's going to get worse as uh, we head into uh, more inflation, more energy uh, pressures, more supply chain issues. It's going to be more and more. However, the best way I think to mitigate some of this is on a few phases, and I'll get to it later, uh, is to have robust communication channels with your, communi with your commercial leaders so that if there is a, a quarter end rush, your commercial leaders can, uh, your commercial directors can then start to divide up the priorities. In one sense, that's kind of their job, um, as opposed to your credit team getting hit with 20 requests, all of which are urgent. So it's best to have that uh, there, but also uh, at a strategic level, uh, make sure that your management understands that the credit function is under an unprecedented level of pressure both internally and externally, and that they are given uh, empowerment to uh, make decisions with, let's say, a, uh, for lack of better words, a diluted level of information. They might not have everything they want to make them comfortable, but have a mindset to say, with the information we have to hand, can we make a robust decision? I think uh, Ian's having some uh, technical issues there and getting, getting off mute. But uh, I just want to pick up uh, on, on a point Brian Brian made uh, in, in terms of the financial provision of, uh, of information. Um, I mean, from an insurance perspective, and we look across our industry, I think your point you made in terms of the, the financial accounts and management accounts, I mean, financial accounts, you're effectively looking at something that's nine months out of date, uh, it's particularly in the UK. So nine months out of date, I mean, uh, we our biggest concern is a risk under are we making a decision now for the next 12 months looking forward? So looking at nine months out of date, that's not the best type of information. So if we can get management accounts, uh, management accounts, some people are open to it, some people are not. It'd be, it'd be good to get, I mean, uh, Brad and Brian, do you actually provide uh, financial or, or, sorry, management accounts to credit insurers yourselves um, if required? Uh, because having the insight and, and seeing the forecast of what you're looking at um, is a lot easier than looking backwards in nine months to make a credit limit decision. Brian, Brian here. Uh, in answer to that question, uh, we, we, we have provided the management account information uh, when we've been asked for it on very few occasions, obviously part of a, a PLC. Uh, it, it's slightly difficult to provide consolidated, but from an, an, an opco uh, provision yes we have done uh, and, and in the recent past to, to one of our major suppliers for exactly that reason that they wanted up-to-date information to to make a decision to increase our credit level with them hi guys um uh, <laughs> thanks for, thanks for for that simon that's appreciated we, we, i think after two years we might have actually got this nailed but uh never mind I, bl I blame the change in location rather than my poor inability to work a uh, internet browser which you know i should really know what i'm doing by now but never mind so thanks brad as well oh, i did want to say thank you and did say thank you but couldn't unmute myself to say thanks for the piece on supply chain dis disruption um i think like you said it's, it's something that still still is affecting us now um we've talked about a couple of things uh, and and hopefully you didn't touch on this one <laughs> had to log off and log back on simon but it'd be good to get your thoughts because you kind of see in your position, whilst not impacted essentially by any of the risks we've talked about just yet, you are, you know, kind of domino effect still impacts you as an insurer, but you get to see everything. So is there any risks that you think that are going to happen or challenges to trade over the next 12 months that we haven't discussed yet? Thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I will briefly touch on uh, what was mentioned because there's, there's play to uh, chain disruption, as Brad mentioned. I mean, uh, we uh, we have uh, a lot of clients in the automotive sector, which, uh, as you know, it's been well publicised. Semiconductors uh, uh, in terms of uh, the availability and supply chain issues, which is ca causing a real impact. 
Um, but also, probably, I'm not sure if we, if anybody's mentioned it yet, Brexit. Um, uh, <laughs> nope. It's 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 that word, isn't it? I mean, if if you look at, uh, we've had many clients who have come to us because Brexit have occurred. Have had, we've had to change their policy requirements because once you set up an insurance policy, there's terms of payments, maximum extension periods you've got to adhere to. Whereas if you are a, so let's choose a sector where you're importing wine, for example, into the UK, it's gone from a, a lead time of, say, 10 days to a lead time of 28 days. Um, so that has a knock-on impact on everything you're looking across the supply chain. And so from an insurance perspective, we've had to uh, amend our policies to make sure it's fit for purpose uh, and nothing get, gets triggered automatically. The other thing that uh, I think is probably worth mentioning is also on that Brexit uh, point, the, there's new inspections that are being introduced. You've got new certificate of inspections being introduced, which are taking that time zone significantly longer than than, expect, than what historically took place. And so if you were looking at you know, a 10 day waiting period, going up to 30 to 40 days, I mean, that has cash flow implications. So um, when we get on to the point in terms of what other things we see, and we're seeing cash flow implications here, um, which I can tie in that into the, the inflationary pressures we're seeing at the moment with uh, sort of hyperinflations. If you're getting the, the inflationary pressures you've got at the moment, and it's probably a, um, a point that uh, Brian made in terms of cost increase, um, what if you are supplying into, I know some steel manufacturers supplying into the automotive, they're on 12 months fixed price contracts. If you're on fixed price contracts, uh, it's very difficult to actually uh, to amend those prices. So you've got to look to absorb them or try and recover them after that 12 month period is up. Um, it'd be good to get some feedback from the other guys as well, actually, if they've seen fixed price contracts in their own sectors, because um, it, it, it is causing us issues. Um, mm -hmm. and then goes in, into the, obviously the issues then leading into liquidity issues. We are then seeing issues at the moment because of the uncertainty moving forward, uh, businesses access to funding. Um, now we do uh, speak on uh, many different forums uh, with uh, UK finance. Um, what, the, the, what we don't see is how busy the banking industry is being at the moment. So we don't know if they are being restricted in the RCS. Uh, facilities, their overdraft facilities, because as everybody know that you know once you uh, once you get into difficulty in a, a economic in environment which is deteriorating, it's not just when you're going into that economic environment that you need it. It's actually coming out of a recession that you need the liquidity because when you're coming out of a recession, you need to grow your working capital, and if you haven't got access to liquidity, then that's a real concern because uh, we see a lot more insolvencies coming out of a recession. So. We are looking, and more of our concern is probably the next maybe 12 to 24 months, not the imminent now, because, you know, are we about to go into recession? That's, um, you know, a, a big question, and I'm sure there's uh, more uh, smarter people than me who can answer that. But once we do go into recession, the concern for us as an underwriter is the access to liquidity coming out of it. Yeah. Yeah, good points. And and Brian, obviously, Simon mentioned about the fixed price contracts. Anything you want to add on that? Um, no, I, I, I would endorse uh, exactly what he said. And just to reiterate the point that I made, that within our industry, um, our customers who are tied into fixed price contracts are not having, don't have the margin to absorb those costs, and yeah. that that's become the problem. Yeah, exactly. And then one, Simon, before we move on to the next question, one thing I just wanted to ask you, obviously, Brian touched on it uh, earlier about the uh, impact of the financials, not only just their age, but also now, you know, their, their validity is being used for, for analysis. Is, is there any thoughts you've got from Markel's side? Is that a problem that you're facing? Is there anything you're doing as an insurer to help, help clients through that? Yeah, I mean, we're trying to be as uh, connected to our, our policyholders as, as, as much as we can. The, the trouble you have with um, um, be careful what I say. The trouble you have with uh, managed accounts is that they're not audited. Um, but uh, obviously, um, auditors uh, have clearly been under scrutiny uh, a lot over the last 24 months. Um, so we really need to uh, concentrate when we're looking at uh, management accounts, uh, the, the reality of them. Uh, if we see a, a set of uh, financial accounts which are deteriorating for the last two years, 
and yet there's inflationary pressures going on now and then we see a set of management accounts which haven't been audited and they look phenomenal we really need to, to question those figures <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah. it, it's really oh, oh, a good. it's really a difficult process to go through because they haven't been audited so you do have to take them with a pinch of salt and that's when you're and probably going back to the point that brad made about relationships that's where your relationship with your client comes to the forefront here is uh, do you buy into the performance of the, or the financial accounts or the management accounts that you're seeing? So it's a case of, yes, Ian, it's, uh, it's, it's getting the management accounts, but it's also being, uh, you know, how, how accurate are these figures you're seeing as well? Yeah, it's not, no surprise it was the, the underwriter that came out with that, but yeah, I would, uh, I would agree. Brad, anything you wanted to add on the, on the financial statement side? I think just making sure that uh, there is making sure the communication is there. Yes, you're going to get uh, managements uh, that won't be uh, detailed. And I think you do have to take them with a pinch of salt, even saying, OK, even if um, even if I erode this margin by X amount, by, you know, if I take their profitability down by a certain percentage, is do they still have buffer? If their uh, collection period was to increase by, uh, let's say, another uh, 20 or 30 days, how much pressure does that put on them? So there are ways I think we should look to maybe just quickly, and again, I think speed, certainly in my industry is quick, but certainly if we can get uh, something in the credit assessment models that will allow you to uh, just tinker with those management accounts and think, right, if I just take away that and take away that, are these guys still treading water? So that I think would be a big help to the credit function inside when we go into these um, these positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Agree. Um, probably one other thing I, I, I haven't mentioned, which is what we're seeing at the moment, is it's more of a macro point of view, um, and you're good to get other people's points, is uh, foreign direct investment into the UK over the last five years has to continue to deteriorate. So that's having a knock-on impact in terms of um, uh, jobs, uh, the wider economy in the UK, um, expertise. Um, it, so it's an interesting fact. If you look at, um, I, mean, I get, get the data of trade and economics, but if you look at FDI investment in the UK since the Brexit decision, you can you can probably understand now why the uh, why the GDP growth in the UK is below the rest of the EU um, because we, we're just not seeing it anymore, and people are questioning. You may have guessed what what uh, my view is on Brexit, but. Uh, um, I think uh, the impact is what we're seeing now is from the decision back in 2016 is, uh, is a real concern moving forward. Yep. Um, well, it's a good thing we're, we're patching those relationships uh, at the moment, aren't we? So that's, that's good to see. Uh, is there any comments, Brad, Brian, that you want to come in on, on on foreign investment or any Brexit impacts that you guys may may have seen? Certainly nothing. Nothing. Yes. Sorry, certainly think the um, the it's both import and export. What I've seen is that um, the up <coughs> that uh, Brexit was touted to say that the UK will be a um, uh, a, a world leader in in um, STEM fields. So what I've seen is a lot of uh, certainly in the technology sector is that that whilst the UK are trying to increase that certainly in uh, technology development, um, what they tr what they then try to do is export the equipment so they configure it in the UK because that's where all the brains are, and then export it to foreign branches, then hitting large uh, tax and uh, export and uh, excise uh, barriers. So uh, this will have a knock on impact for the um, you know, for the for the for the total cost of the uh, of, of the uh, exercise they're looking at cool thanks brad um so we're going to move away from the happy topic of, uh, of brexit just for a, a period of time oh, yeah. uh, that's fine mate. it's fine it definitely is a risk and i think obviously it's one of those where we didn't see the full impact because of the pandemic and and, and only now are you kind of seeing this um mix up of, of different different uh, events um but one, what i do want to focus on uh, and i'm going to come to you with this brian is is obviously the pandemic changed a lot of things for us ignore the obviously the human impact i'm talking more about the ways of working the way we worked as teams do you think there's anything or is there anything that you personally as a, as a business and as an individual have learned in terms of from the handling of the pandemic uh, quite a few things. I'm, I'm sure there will be uh, people writing books about this uh, in, in time to come. Uh, 
initially, I, I would say the reaction uh, to the pandemic and the, the changes that were forced upon us um, and the way that the businesses uh, changed to that and, and in many, many cases with serious pace uh, behind those changes. Uh, mm -hmm. Apart from the IT issues, um, heaven knows, I've, I've, said, I've said this previously, if we put this plan into place with an IT department, we would say, well, to do this would take probably two or three years. With the situation that we were all facing, it took two or three weeks, the majority mm -hmm. of businesses were up and running remotely, uh, working with hybrid pa uh, patterns or working uh, totally remotely. And I think everybody should give themselves a pat on the back for the way that they reacted. The, well, some of the other things that um, I saw come out of it um, was the decision-making process in the business. Those rules of engagement were relaxed. People were taking decisions quicker. Uh, they were prepared to take an element of risk uh, and stand by those decisions, uh, whether they were good, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, but also, what we learned as, as we went along, uh, there was an adaptability uh, to change as, as, as the situation reflected the, the need to do so. And if we look at the other factor that, um, oh, sorry, the other factor in that was the resilience of staff uh, to take on the change and react, and also to be uh, a real font of ideas and knowledge and suggestions of how things could be done differently, in some cases better, uh, in lots of cases better. Um, and I come back to the, the uh, my opening comment on that. It's just the sheer pace to which everybody reacted, and, and I'm, I mean that positively, um, both from a business viewpoint and also from a customer viewpoint, because uh, whilst we had a close down for a period of time, once the lockdown eased and we were coming back in, into uh, supply and uh, production um, and manufacturing uh, for the customers they, they were they were producing and they were building they changed too and their attitude to the supplies changed uh, and i think that um overall environment that, that, that we were in and the way people uh, reacted and respected each other is something that uh, came out came out of it and showed everybody in a good light Mm -hmm. Yep, completely agree, Brian. In terms of now that we've kind of come out of that and businesses are returning to normality, I mean, just talk, thinking about your business specifically here, but how mm. have you kind of found that that snap back? Are you still retaining a lot of the changes that you made during those two years, or have you have you kind of found new ways of working post pandemic? Uh, it, it's a it's a bit of both, to be honest. Um, we we certainly held on to the the good lessons. Um, we still work hybrid. We have a hybrid working model. Um, we, we, we've changed in terms of um, how, how our staff can work. And uh, we've, we've changed uh, in terms of the point that um, was being made earlier on uh, by Brad of, how, of how, we, how we look at, for example, the, the risk assessment uh, cha has changed a wee bit. Uh, it's, it's a speedy process, and some of those things that people were doing for the sake of doing, we've, we've, we've cast aside and tried, tried to use our time uh, a lot more productively and say, well, we don't need to do that because it's just, it's just a check what you need to do. For example, uh, nothing came out of it, and we can replace it by doing B instead of doing A. Um, and in terms of uh, the working environment, People have got used to a bit more space around the desks. Um, and I, I come back to the fact that we, we, we are still operating a, a hybrid model uh, to people's choice. Uh, we, have, yeah. we have to change the contract of employment to give them the option and specify what they would like to do. Um, and that's been, been received, received well. Uh, and, in, you know, and the staff themselves uh, seem, seem happier and productive and quite a lot of people were we're grateful for furlough and the grateful that they, they also come back to to the job they're doing beforehand yeah yeah that's really good to hear because i know that a lot of businesses have struggled kind of finding their feet 
in terms of coming back to normality and how much they revert back, how much they don't. It's just interesting to hear, hear your sides. Um, Simon, Brad, anything you want to add in in terms of lessons learned from the pandemic? I think just touching on, on what Brian just said there, I mean, uh, I think the, 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 the hybrid model, which uh, he touched on, the, the, working, the working from home and uh, what day should you be in the office, what day should you be at home, I think mm -hmm. uh, the sort of staff morale is a lot higher with a hybrid model, um, which makes a big difference on productivity. Um, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I, I look at it from a uh, two perspectives. One, business development, where we all, we all need to get more clients, but e equally uh, from a maintaining relationship point of view as well. I think uh, both as a place, the online, online, you can maintain relationships, that's fine, but actually to establish and uh, on the business development side and actually pitch for business, for me, that has to be done uh, face to face. You get a lot more in terms of connectivity when you're speaking to the opposite person um, in a room than what you would online if you meet them for the first per, uh, first time. And after that first time, agreed, I think you can maintain relationships. I mean, there's nothing worse than uh, me having a day of my time spent when I have to travel 400 miles to a meeting and 400 miles back. That's, I'm spending the best part of eight to 10 hours driving for the day. Um, which uh, clearly is not productive. But then if you, if you look at that from a staff perspective in, in, a, in a company, if you are taking out two hours a day commuting back and forth work, that's, that's easily two hours uh, uh, of more available time. You have to potentially do more work. Um, what we found at Markel, productivity levels have increased uh, with the hybrid model because of that very reason. Hmm. And uh, Brad, any, any final thoughts for you on, in terms of that hybrid working, so the, the kind of post-pandemic lessons that have been learned? Uh, I think it, 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 I think it's a matter of productivity. Again, you, you do lose commuting time, uh, like was just said there, with um, with uh, visiting clients. So I, I think as long as the job is getting done and getting done well, um, but there is no, we're a social animal. There is no substitute for us working uh, face to face, having those uh, accidental uh, coffee. So I think it's just a coffee catch up <laughs> with less Brad anyway, but I agree with him on the social point. Now, you know, I thought he was, Brad was going to say it for me, but you know, somebody who, um, who's obviously started at a new business. Luckily, as we came out of lockdown, I would say the social aspect of it is one that uh, that is is vitally important. Um, I'm going to hop to you, Simon, for the next question because that gives Brad time to to log back on before we get to the final question. And just one final shout out, even though you might think that I don't know how to work this platform given what happened earlier, I can still see the questions. So if you have any questions you want to put forward, please do so. Um, but Simon, coming to you, is there any trends other than the ones we've discussed, really, that you're seeing in the market right now? And, and importantly, trends that you're expecting to continue into 2020 for the rest of 2022 and 2023? Yeah, there's probably two points that we're seeing, um, and we're seeing this across most sectors. Because of uh, how fragile the economic environment is, uh, we're seeing a, a liquidity issue. But we don't think it's because uh, there's current unavailable liquidity, liquidity here. What businesses tend to do if they if they see an economic uh, deterioration, they tend to hoard their cash. So what it then in, in, impacts then is the actual paying of invoices becomes a lot longer. So I've, I've spoken to a many, many of my credit managers uh, who have policies with us for this week, just to get some feedback here. And that's their biggest concern, is it's taking longer to get invoices paid. Uh, primarily because, not because the cash isn't there, it's because of the unexpected future economic performance. Uh, businesses are concerned, so they are actually holding on to cash a lot longer. Um, I mean, it'd be good to get, obviously, the guys doing that because they're actually in the businesses, but that's what the, the our clients are actually seeing. And, and probably the second point uh, we are seeing, Ian, um, we are seeing businesses invest in credit management uh, procedures a lot more now. So while you can get, uh, there's plenty of uh, uh, sort of cr credit forums. We've seen new credit forums come up, start up over the last two years. Um, clearly, we're on one today. 
Um, we're uh, we're seeing investment into um, information providers increase um, because that everybody wants knowledge. Um, so it, what we, what I would suggest is if you are looking to uh, look look at the trends at the moment, um, I, I think information providers and investing in credit management procedures is probably one thing that we're seeing quite grow quite considerably over the last say six to twelve months. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and Brian, from your side on the liquidity piece, um, someone mentioned about the kind of receivables days, debt to days increasing. Is that something you're starting to see in your business? Um, at the end of May, I've got to say a resounding no to that. We, we had a good month. Uh, but when you look at the underlying trend, you are seeing the same name starting to come up now with those mm-hmm. issues that Simon referred to, uh, lo- looking to hold for a little bit longer and if they, if they can change the, the way they pay you you, know, you, have, you have these subtle habit changes uh, they, they they move you a payment day out by three or four days they may decide to stop paying you by faster same day payments and go to a fax it slows it down even further even further or heaven forbid they say i'm going to send you a check uh, which will cost you a, 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 another week so it, it's been able to pick up on those, like I said, those subtle changes in habit. Uh, and if you see it reoccurring and it's the same people, I would say after three months, you know you've probably got an issue there. And yeah, I, I am Live I am seeing I am, I am seeing that in a in few instances uh, across across the legs. Um mm. and we're tackling those those customers. We're having those conversations with those customers now. Uh, we're, we're not waiting for the payments to, to arrive. We're saying, what, what's the problem? What can we do to help? Um, and we need to get you back. We need to get you back to terms. We're, we're, we're not going to be looking to extend terms, but if it's a one month blip, then it's something we can do. Um, and also, um, fighting against something that's rearing its head again now um, is pay and pay culture. Uh, I can only pay you next week, and I've been paid myself. So, well, that again, it's not the game we're in. Know, in terms of business finance, uh, yeah. we're, we're, not, we're not here to see that. And um, as I say, that that culture just starting to raise its head again. Right, Brian, you mentioned the uh, one comment there about uh, which is interesting because uh, there's not many sectors I see now where they say they they're going to send a check for payment. Uh, yeah. I mean, is, is it quite prevalent? I mean, would you say is a large percentage in your in the uh, construction industry is into checks, or because most of the, what I see now is direct debits? Yep, uh, well, we, we don't operate direct debit, uh, unfortunately. Something we might see on the ERP system next year. Uh, and I've, I've actually done an analysis of checks over six weeks from then, you know, uh, to see what, what's coming in and who's sending them. Um, and on, on average, we, we, we get one, one, one a day. So we get 30, 35 checks a month uh, uh, coming through. Uh, and they tend to come in, in, in batches. Uh, the average is daily. Uh, and we, we have a small number. So we're, we're, the, the plan is to give them to another uh, month or two, and then we'll, we'll start picking them off one by one and saying, we're, we're going to stop taking checks. You need to make a, a electronic payment to us one way or the other. Mm. Uh, and again, the, the cynic in me just suggests it's a way to slow down payment to you, because if, if they can delay exactly. saying that check for two days, three days, it costs you a week in, in real terms. A minimum of a week. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you on that, Brian. And there'll be some attendees as well. I'm, I'm not fortunate enough to be of this of that age group, but, but there'll be some people that'll be thinking, "What's a check?" So, <laughs> so yeah, like you said, it's uh, Thanks for that. yeah. <laughs> it's fine. I'm, I'm in the same category, so it's fine. By the way, a check is not a check on a piece of paper. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, Brad, I'm conscious to come to you for the fi- for the final call. We have had a question sent here, which we will come to, but I'm conscious to come to you. So I'm going to go out of order a little bit here because um, I'm going to catch you sure. whilst you are here. Um, and Thank you. Uh, that's okay, mate. So, what three items would you recommend to your fellow credit managers uh, in uh, items to implement into their businesses? Yeah, sure. I'll uh, be quick because it's a fairly big topic. But in in terms, I think, first of all, 
um, internally. Uh, any financial services company or function, your database is actually your engine room. So you need to make sure that your engine room is as lean as possible. So this makes sure that your data is clean. Uh, so that you, and that's not just a one-time cleanup exercise, you may need to do that, but also making sure that the data that you enter is, uh, does have proper controls and validations. Um, you may need to review the sources of that data, but I think maybe coming up to the summer where a few people are away, it's probably a good point to get that in line when um, when businesses may be a bit, of, uh, bit, um, a bit quiet. But uh, then the point is, if you've got your data, your internal data uh, in place, then you can turn that into, um, then you've got to make sure that you've got on top of that tools that can interrogate that data because you want to turn that data into information, that information into a narrative, and then that narrative is something that can be used to support decision making. So make sure your data is clean and robust. Secondly, externally, now that you've got your external, now that you've got a, a, a decent database in place, uh, then you can look to identify your high risk and your high value customers. And then as we've been saying, uh, go old school, reach out to them, call them and ask them how are you uh, how are you dealing with the market conditions every week is bad news week how are you uh, looking at supply chain issues rising energy costs a, a pending recession how are you handling it and then with that in mind see how you can best align each other not just think how can i help you but how can we align because what was just said there you don't want that oh, i'll pay when i get paid you've got to make sure that you are also um, able to flourish as a financial service within this industry. Um, so you've got to make sure that you've got that those channels of information open. And if they mention that they're in difficulties, uh, you almost want to welcome them saying that, make it easy because they will have difficulties. And if you can say, I'm glad you spoke to me now because it gives us time and it gives us therefore more options to do something rather than trying to hobble something together at the last minute. Uh, so make sure that you do have that open communication with them so you've got good uh, implementation so that you can say, if you're going through a bad point, give us monthly or quarterly or half yearly management information to get over the hump that we've got with knowing that the statutory information that's on file is probably going to be out of date. That's the second point. Third point, empower your credit function. If that is uh, making even something simple like, can the person who's chasing a credit uh, letter, an overdue invoice, do they have some discretion to at least alleviate a small problem, waiver some late payment fees, if that there is a valid reason, give them some uh, ex uh, power to extend maybe on a small value invoice under let's say 500 pounds or something like that. If you've got that in place, you can at least say that you're making a, a, a modest contribution, you've gone back to your client and you've said, okay, we've given you a little leeway, now let's work to uh, put this together. So what I've noticed, so third thing, just make sure that your credit function is empowered to make those quick and timely decisions, knowing that they might not have the best uh, set of data in place. I've noticed that, that certainly in our experience in uh, within Dell is that if you had those three things in place, robust data so you knew what you were doing, good customer communication so you could get the best version of what their story is, and three, local empowerment at the people who can make decisions, you, you get through that with not completely unscathed, but with a much reduced risk and loss profile. Yeah, I really like those points, Brad, and I completely agree. I mean, I think the empowerment one is is one. We were talking earlier around lessons from the pandemic and people being agile, not just in terms of where they're physically located, but also in terms of their day-to-day -day work. Is, is that something you guys have implemented uh, your side, Dale? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. The moment we saw that um, lockdowns were in place, we thought, okay, we're going to, we are going to expect customers to call and ask for moratoriums or extensions mm. or payment plans um so do that and that that uh and not only that because we were a regulated institution that really went well with the regulators um we weren't uh, because they could see a great deal of customer engagement and reporting transparency they could trust us the regulators could trust us with what we were doing and also our stakeholders right up to um dell and so forth like that the shareholders they could say these guys know what's going on they've got a handle on things so we can trust they're on the ground 
day-to-day, minute-to-minute decision-making. Yep, completely agree. Um, th- I'm going to come to you with this question. Again, I'm conscious that uh, I don't want to lose you, and uh, I think this is one that would be, uh, would be important for yourself. So the question is coming from Charles, and asks, what he asks is, the shipping industry seems to still struggle to fulfil orders. How are UK exporters coping or organising their shipments abroad? I don't know if that's something you want to speak on, Brad, or we can get Simon's thoughts as well. Uh, probably that's just Simon on that one. <laughs> Sorry. To be honest, one it's not one I'm. Uh, I would. I, I'd like to comment on it, uh, Ian. Uh, oh, my. To be honest, you've got the wrong uh, Mark L uh, senior underwriter on yeah. you. He needed Mr. Jones on you for his wondering expertise. So uh, yeah. probably I won't comment on that one. I did see the earlier question, though, uh, Ian, which was um, one of the best things that could happen from an economic perspective. Um, and, and it's probably a point to make, um, and this won't happen, other than rejoining the EU. Um, clearly... Um, Really, I think uh, the, the destabilization we're seeing in Russia, Ukraine at the moment has, has had a, a global knock on impact across the globe. Um, we're seeing inflation across most industries, not many, unless um, uh, uh, the guys tell me any different, Brad, or Brad, maybe from the IT perspective, but um, we're seeing inflation across every sector, and a lot of it's been, been due to what's happening in the, the conflict. Um, if, if that was resolved, I'm sure the economic outlook would look a lot more favorable. Mm-hmm. Cool. Thanks for that. And uh, you need to get off that fence when it comes to Brexit, Sam. Um, so uh, <laughs> going, going to you, Brian, uh, same question I asked Brad. So what, what three things would you um, recommend to your fellow credit managers? Oh yeah. Well, the, the things we did in the early days of lockdown was to ensure that we enforced our terms. Um, and st- stand by T's and C's. And the point that Brad's made, and I, I, I alluded to earlier on, is discuss with your customers. If there's a problem, open the door to them, um, talk to them, come to a resolution that's agreeable to yourselves, uh, that works for both parties, and that support, I'm sure, will, will get rewarded in the long run from, from the customer, because they, they do tend to remember those who have helped them. Um, and the, the other point I would make uh, which is, I think, has been unspoken so far this morning. Um, you need to go outside with your sales team. You need to involve your sales team. Uh, if you can get to their meetings, if you can talk to them, you can help them. You can get them to resolve the queries uh, a lot more uh, faster for yourselves if you, if you have queries and disputes. Um, and tap into their knowledge to the customer. Um, they they will have a different level of contact. Uh, which may be more beneficial uh, to going through procurement as an example uh, to to get the result that you want. Uh, and that knowledge there uh, should be drained away from them, uh, learn as much as you can, use them, and also show them, as Brad made a great, a great point uh, about identifying the customers. Identify your high risk, identify uh, the high volume customers, I would also go one step further and I would look at those high volume, low margin customers and ask, is it, is it worthwhile dealing with these? And have a conversation with the sales teams. You may be able to point them at a customer who's got a better margin, whose volumes are down and, and work together. Yeah. Yeah, love that. Love that point. I'd, I'd, I'd actually dovetail off that and I'd say, if, if you want to die in the current economic environment, if you really want to sink your business and have enormous losses and panic and people are quitting, if that's what you want for your business uh, within the credit function, the best thing to do is to make sure the credit is not talking to commercial. <laughs> I'm sorry to be <laughs> ironic there, but, but yeah, look, I, I would recommend anybody who, uh, any credit function who is not w- weekly, if not you know, bi-weekly, almost daily, if it gets to this point, um, having a schedule carved out, we must have a half hour meeting between the credit management, management and the commercial management, if, and, and even bring in operations or something like that. But if you are not having that conversation on a very regular basis, you will die a little bit simple as that. What survived uh, me, especially on quarter ends, is that every day at four o'clock, um, I had a call with my commercial director and said, right, tell me your problems. Yell at me. Scream at me. 
throw all the problems at me and let's work a solution every day and then we can know and then the next time we call how is that deal going how is that order going how is that uh, problem and we can say done resolved waiting on issue uh, customers bucking at us whatever but if you don't have that on a on, on a regular basis you're going to die in the water simple as that yep good, uh, good point and uh, I, I completely agree and uh, it comes back to that information as well because as Brian rightly said there might be customers that are better ones to target that potentially your commercial teams aren't looking at but you may have the information to show exactly why they're the better targets to be going after so yep I agree with that Simon Last but no means least on this final question, the three three items, not, not yeah. your fellow credit managers, but still. Yeah, no, no, I, I actually asked a few of the credit managers we deal with um, on this, and uh, the, the consensus is, and a lot of this is not rocket science, and it's largely what uh, guys have touched on as well. Uh, one of the key points that they have in uh, the credit management is, is a robust query management system to manage invoice queries proactively. Um, so you're on top of it. So in terms of what I mean by that is you're chasing prior to due date on invoices and you're placing people on stop on due date. Don't let it go 15 days past because that's, that's clearly, clearly going to impact your liquidity uh, further down the line. You need to be really uh, uh, proactive. Uh, and the last point for me would be, uh, uh, which has been measured by Brad, is get close to your customers, build the relationships, build the partnerships, and just basically making sure you have a voice um that uh, you can be heard that you're that, that it's you you have that strong relationship that you can have an impact excellent thanks simon so for me it looks like the three resounding um topics that have come out of those is relationships both internal and external empowering credit management um as, as obviously brad and brian both talked about and then the last one is about being proactive so i really appreciate that so that's the last of our questions that wraps up our session thanks obviously to everybody who's who's still logged in we're, we're gonna when we go back to doing this in person we're gonna miss all this fun of you know people <laughs> dialing out and mutes and all that kind of stuff it'll, it'll feel far too easy um but yeah thanks, thanks everyone for listening obviously thanks to our panelists as well so simon brian and brad um and yeah i look forward to uh to the next session thanks ian yeah um thank you everybody appreciate that so yeah no really really interesting uh to hear everybody's thoughts there probably for everybody who's tuned in with the technical stuff uh it's frustrating for everybody watching as i'm sure it is for us but hopefully it didn't uh, interrupt the main content of the event um so hopefully that was good um obviously we're running time so we're going to move to our next session in around about uh 15 minutes, which starts at 10.45, and we're going to be looking at the threat of fraud upon commercial credit management, which we're hoping wasn't the reason why we uh, were interrupted in this event. So uh, I shouldn't really joke about it, but it, it, it's, it's obviously a, a big issue that's going to be impacting a lot of businesses. So we'll be looking at that shortly, um, and Ian will be joining us again later for a session on technology at 1 p.m. So um, I'd like to wrap this session up now by um, thanking Ian, Brad, Simon and Brian for all their thoughts and insight. And of course, Ian, especially for chairing the session. Uh, we're going to wrap this up now uh, for this particular session. For anybody who's missed it, it's recorded. So we will share this on the uh, Commercial Credit Collections uh, website soon as well. Uh, we linked, but for now, we'll say goodbye and uh, thank you all for tuning in. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.